How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today we're traveling to Louisiana and Western Pennsylvania to meet people on the front lines of fossil fuel extraction. We'll learn about their personal health, their tragedies, and what they think about government protections. Arlie Hochschild is professor of sociology at UC Berkeley and author of nine books. Her most recent work is Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Eliza Griswold is a journalist at The New Yorker and a fellow at Harvard Divinity School. Her most recent book is Amity and Prosperity, One Family and the Fracturing of America. Later in the show, we'll discuss how the U.S. has surpassed Saudi Arabia as the world's biggest oil producer. So Eliza Griswold, tell us about Stacey Haney. Her dad was a Vietnam vet. She thinks that U.S. energy is better than foreign energy. Tell us about Stacey. So Stacey Haney is a nurse and a single mom of two kids, and she and her family have for about the past hundred years been from two towns in southwestern Pennsylvania, just where Appalachia begins, and the towns are named Amity and Prosperity. Um, and Stacy, you know, she has... She is truly a remarkable person. She has this small farm. She's had it for, for really, the, the family has had it for about a century. Um, it belonged to her great-grandfather. And what happened in 2010 and 2011 is that her son, who was 14 at the time, Harley, began to develop mysterious illnesses. And she, as a nurse, had the capacity to do some testing. And she found that she and her daughter and her son had benzene and toluene in their bodies. And Harley had arsenic poisoning. And once she got this information, she knew that there was gas drilling just next door, unconventional drilling fracking, about a quarter of a mile from her house. But then her daughter looked in her seventh grade uh, computer science class looked at their their house on Google Earth, and she saw that just a quarter of a mile from them, there was a seven-acre industrial waste pond. And it turned out that pond was not only leaking, it was off-gassing near lethal levels of hydrogen sulfide into the air. Uh, it was literally rotting with a bacterial infection. These were just the very beginning of the elements that Stacy learned about this mystery that was unfolding next door to her and how it might be impacting her family. Myself. And there's one dramatic moment where I think she's in a room with her friend Beth and some energy representatives, and they're about to sign a lease for, uh, and she, she seemed pretty conflicted. So tell us about that moment. So, you know, when, when fracking came to southwestern Pennsylvania, a lot of the messaging around it and a lot of the reason that Stacy wanted to sign a lease was this idea of energy independence, which is clearly nothing new. But to Stacy, it felt patriotic, and it felt patriotic for a couple of reasons. First of all, she comes from the Rust Belt, and the promise of industries return. Her dad is an out-of-work steelworker, and they grew up in poverty. So the idea that she was doing something for her region so people might go back to work. That was very positive. But what was also positive, you mentioned her father was a Vietnam combat vet, and she really wanted to keep American troops out of harm's way, out of foreign entanglements over oil. And so she thought that she was really doing her duty by signing this lease, and she was also going to end up with a $9,000 payment that would allow her to build her dream barn. And that was really, she thought, going to secure her spot in the middle class. Arlie Hochschild, one, one of the characters in your book is Lee Sherman. It sort of epitomizes the, the great paradox. So tell us about Lee Sherman and the great paradox. Well, Lee Sherman uh, worked uh, all his life for petrochemical uh, companies. He was a pipe fitter and a uh, fixer of any leak uh, that was in a pipe. And he worked uh, for Pittsburgh Plate and Glass. And... Uh, um, one day, um, he uh, was asked by his boss to take on a certain mission, and it would be in, at dusk when nobody could see, and there was something called a tar 
buggy and it was heated from the bottom and it had all the toxic waste and sludge that had produced that day. And it was Lee's job to uh, look left, look right, make sure no one was seeing and uh, uh, unscrew uh, a, a valve and uh, release this toxic waste into uh, public waters. And he uh, told me this. He was uh, uh, is now in his 80s. And he told me that he was felt guilty about doing this. But one thing happened that on the job, he himself was exposed to ethylene dichloride. And he got sick, couldn't move his legs. So he was put on medical leave by the company doctor. And later he was uh, fired for absenteeism. So here's a man who'd been doing the dirty work for the company, who himself was now out of a job and out of health. And he became an environmentalist later in life and also an enthusiastic uh, voter for Donald Trump. And uh, I have periodic conversations with him about he, how he puts these two things together. I think Quite of stable. all the characters and, and the stories in your remarkable book, Arlie, it's Lee Sherman who is just indelible. And the complexity of that moral situation that yeah. I just can't get out of my head. So eventually, uh, Stacy gets some information. Uh, so finish her story. There's a sad part where you know, she has to leave her land. Yeah, so Stacy has to leave her land. I mean, following this in real time was mind-bending. So finally what happens is her kids are so sick, um, they have to move out. They move into a trailer behind her parents' house in, in the nearby town of Amity. Her parents don't have drinking water, which is his own story, um, which I won't get into now. But, you know... So she's living in a trailer with her kids. At night, it's so cold that they try not to roll over because they stick to the trailer's walls um, because they're warm and the trailer is cold. She's constantly on the move. They really are a different kind of climate refugee. You know, they're really moving as a result of extraction next door to their house. And they lose, in the process, the way that she and her neighbor, Beth Voyles, start to put together what's happening is the death of their animals. They keep mm. losing goats and dogs and horses. And and it's that kind of sensitivity to toxicity that makes them put the story together. So they lose everything. She loses a house. She loses a way of life. She loses her farm. She loses all of, all of her animals because when the house is abandoned, wild dogs end up attacking the farm. And that was just, I mean, it was really apocalyptic. And as much as the story is about fracking, it's really much more a story of the failure of the common good mm -hmm. and and what it is that binds us together. Well, there's also the electoral map that every president pays attention to, and there's a lot of red states that are very important to get reelected, and those states wanted to have some kind of extraction. He was trying to, you know, the Jerry Brown thing, you paddle to the right, you paddle to the left, and you... But it's not so much the states that wanted the extraction, it's the industry that wanted the extraction. And when you look at what drives fracking, and you're going to have uh, Bethany McLean, who is another hero here, just wrote an amazing book called Saudi America, Wall Street, her question is, would fracking exist without Wall Street? And the answer she reaches is no, because actually fracking isn't turning a profit. What is What comes out of fracking, the money is basically investment money. She, she'll tell you much better than I can summarize her amazing work. But again, talking systemically, talking about our responsibility in New York City to those who live in Pennsylvania, the money is coming from Wall Street. So mm. th the reality- Which comes from the pension plans of people sitting yeah. in this exactly. room and listening to this podcast. Exactly. So what, when I asked Bethany, is this a Ponzi scheme? She said it's an unintentional Ponzi scheme, as most Ponzi schemes are, which, again, she, she's amazing. Listen to her herself. But this, we have culpability here. It's not just distant ca Texas execs or red state people voting for energy. No, it's Wall Street. But Arlie Hochschild, you talk about how some of the dirtiest states are the reddest states. And, you know, tell us that correlation. So yes, actually, um, you know, uh, it's a part of a, a whole uh, red state paradox, actually. How come across the country, it's uh, the red states are the states that uh, have the most poverty, 
you know, most disrupted families, uh, the lowest life expectancy. As part of that, the worst pollution. And uh, the closer you are to a zip code that um, has a high rate of uh, exposure to uh, toxic waste, the more likely you are to be a Republican, the more likely you are to agree with uh, such a statement as uh, the government is already doing enough uh, to uh, uh, preserve uh, the environment. In 1988, it didn't the, the environment didn't used to be a partisan issue. You had just as many Republicans as Democrats worried about it. Now we're doing the splits. And so now is the time for us to get together with uh, uh, the skeptics and sit down and see if we can't find common ground. You say skeptics, that implies sort of conversion. I want to talk a little bit, the idea that people need to be converted to the way we see it. If yeah. those people would just think like me, mm. everything would be fine. Yeah. 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 Is, that, is that the way that, you know, that's, that's not finding common ground. It's just like, I want to no. persuade you. I want to convince you. Isn't that what a lot you know, of what our political dialogue is right in, now? In, uh, in, in writing Strangers, I met an extraordinary person. His name was General Russell Honoré. And he uh, was the rescuer. Uh, in 2005 of the victims of Katrina. Uh, and he now has become uh, an ardent environmentalist. He's leading the environmental movement. And I watched how he talked to non-environmentalists. And he, he did it this way, not by arrogantly kind of uh, disregarding the values and symbols of the people he's talking to, but by acknowledging them and doing what I would call a symbol stretch. I'll give you an example. He was talking to a group of Lake Charles uh, businessmen whose mantra was freedom, freedom. Uh, they didn't want anything to do with uh, environmental regulations. So freedom to invest your money, freedom to make a lot of money, freedom from onerous regulations, freedom. And so he's talking to them. They don't like environmentalists, don't even like the word. And he says this, I woke up this morning and I looked out at Lake Charles. I saw a man in a boat and that man had his fishing line out. But that man is not free to lift up an uncontaminated fish. I thought, you genius. <laughs> oh, I followed him around for the next day. You know, uh, just how, does, how do we do that? We need to do that with patriotism, not say, oh, you're silly to be patriotic. No, of course not. We're patriotic too, but what does patriotism mean? Doesn't it mean a free press? Doesn't it mean an independent judiciary? Doesn't it mean democracy? I mean, you start with the symbol and you, you apply it more broadly. Production of oil and gas in the United States has surged to levels unthinkable a decade ago due to the revolution in hydraulic fracturing. Fracking made the U.S. the world's largest supplier of natural gas, and recently the country surpassed Saudi Arabia and Russia as the world's biggest oil producer. On the show today, we'll explore what it means for our economy, public health, and the environment. Joining us is Severin Borenstein, professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley, Bethany McLean is a writer for Vanity Fair and author of the book, Saudi America, The Truth About Fracking and How It's Changing the World. She also wrote the book, The Smartest Guys in the Room, a chronicle of the Enron debacle that was made into a documentary film. Cassie Siegel is senior counsel at the Center for Biological Diversity, an advocacy group. Severin Bornstein, I think a lot of people don't really realize how fracking is really, and Bethany writes about this, really a manufacturing process compared to a billion dollar oil refinery or offshore platform that is uh, planned to be operated and, and, and generate revenue for 30 years. Tell us how fracking is two or three years and it's manufacturing, it's repeat, do it again. Yeah, so the fracking technology, uh, the, when you, in the conventional technology, when you drill oil wells, they tend to last for decades. And the fracking technology is tapping into smaller, they're not even pools, they're rocks, and uh, pulling the oil out. And the really important point of that is that a typical frack well 
is tapped out mostly in five years or less. Uh, so this isn't a process of making a huge investment and then reaping the gains for decades. It's a, it's a process of constantly having to drill new wells. It's a manufacturing process that's innovating all the time, and there's a huge amount of money to be made in making it more efficient. And so when, uh, when we saw the crash of oil prices in 2014, they had gotten up above $100 a barrel, um, and they headed down, and Saudi Arabia and many American analysts said, $70 a barrel is gonna wipe these guys out. And they started innovating and they started getting costs down. And they, they still couldn't survive at 30 or $40 a barrel, but they, that pressure forced them to become much more efficient. And so now I think most of the industry thinks that they can break even at 50 or $60 a barrel. Now, that still doesn't make it a good bet if we start to actually reduce demand because Saudi Arabia and Iran and a lot of other countries have five or $10 oil. And there's a lot of that in the world. Bethany McLean, tell us how, in a way, Saudi Arabia tried to put Texas frackers out of business, but really squeeze them, you know, squeeze them and squeeze them out of the market. So it's a little bit of mythology and a little bit of truth. People who know Saudi Arabia and recent events have shown this only too painfully and horribly, have cautioned me into it about thinking you can ever understand anything the kingdom is 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 doing from 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 the outside. But there was this widespread belief that as oil prices started to fall in 2014, Saudi Arabia made what came to be seen as this pivotal decision not to cut production um, because cutting production would have increased prices and thereby um, help save American frackers. And so people saw it as this concerted effort to put American frackers out of out of business and remove them as a competitive threat from, from the oil market. And look, it almost worked. I mean, I think 150 companies um, went, went bankrupt during that period. A million barrels of production came offline and it kind of underscored the, um, the, the fragility of this of, of this industry. Um, and to your point that it emerged stronger, it did in some ways, although I think some of that, some of the reason that it survived is because Wall Street didn't go away. The capital is still there. And that has more to do with dynamics in the capital markets than it does to do with anything going on in fracking per se. Um, because the Federal Reserve cut interest rates so much in the wake of the financial crisis in order to prop up the economy, that's resulted in capital flows in two ways. One is that interest rates are really cheap, so it's easy or have been so that it's been really easy for heavily debt-laden debt, debt companies to, to raise money. And the second is that a lot of pension funds who can't earn returns in places that they used to have been increasingly putting money into riskier areas like private equity firms um, and credit-based hedge funds, which in turn put money into fracking companies. And so the most important aspect, I think, in the comeback of the industry wasn't the industry's innovation, although that, that was there, but it was the fact that Wall Street was still there and the capital didn't go away. So from Bornstein, the, the carbon math, you know, these companies are going to defend their profits as, that, as their shareholders want them to do. What's the solution? If it's not going to be regulation, you know, is it innovation? Is it technology? You know, the carbon budget is being consumed every day. We're here, we're here talking kind of like business as usual while there's this ticking climate that we acknowledge. And you know, we talk about it and then we kind of push it to the side and go back to business as usual. All of us sort of do that. What's well, I, I mean, we took a giant step backward in November 2016 because we lost the federal government as a partner in this. And now California is one of the largest economies in the world that possibly the largest that's making a real effort to, uh, re to reduce climate change. The real contribution California can make is in innovation. That's what we've been doing in every other industry. We're a knowledge-based economy. We need to figure out how to make electric cars that are actually cost effective. We need to figure out how to electrify a lot of things we do. Uh, we need to figure out how to integrate renewables into a grid and still have a stable grid where people can get cost, co uh, cost effective uh, and reliable electricity. California is doing a lot of that. We will demonstrate that you can run a grid at 60% renewables. And Five years ago, a lot of people said you couldn't, and California has made tremendous progress. And I think that's a much bigger contribution towards pushing, uh, pushing the technology forward that can come in under the fossil fuels and therefore be adopted in poor countries. So when you ask India to reduce their greenhouse gases, when coal-fired power is incredibly cheap in India, uh, the way I think we're going to get there is partially they're going to start 
paying more attention to the local pollution, which is a huge problem in India and cuts many years off of people's lives. But partially, they're just going to say, boy, we can do solar and wind power in a cost-effective way. And if we can do that, then I think these poor countries are more likely to do it. Otherwise, they're going to grow the way we grew, by burning a lot of fossil fuels and emitting a lot of greenhouse gases. In which case, we're all toast. Yeah. Cassie Siegel. Severin, you bring up poor countries and, and invoke them to not do it here in California, but at the, at the UN climate talks last year in Bonn, the 47 least developed countries in the nation said to the developed world, we need you to take urgent action to stay below 1.5 degrees, including no new fossil fuels and a managed phase out of fossil fuel production. That's what we need. So to invoke poor countries when they have spoken for themselves, uh, pleading, they <laughs> the, the most climate vulnerable countries have been pleading for decades for urgent action, and we are out of time. We have heard the same arguments you're making since the 90s and before then. Nobody's saying we don't need action on demand side, but we need urgent on a wartime footing action to get this done. And you have argued in, um, you have argued against doing anything on California's uh, own dirty oil production. I couldn't disagree more vehemently with that. Three quarters of the oil produced here is more climate damaging than what comes from the tar sands of Alberta, Canada. There is no place better suited in the world than California to lead the way on what we know we need at the most fundamental level. We need to leave fossil fuels in the ground. And for decades we've heard, let's do more R&D and let's work on demand and only working on, the, uh, only working on the demand side, only working at the tailpipes and the smokestacks. We, we, we've, we've done that for decades, and yes, we need to accelerate that, but if we only work on that, that is the loophole to avoid actually getting there. In order to get there, we know what we need to do. We have a carbon budget. We need to leave these fossil fuels in the ground. It's necessary, and it's inevitable, or we go above 1.5 degrees, and the choice is stark. Between 1.5 and 2 degrees, the uh, IPCC, the body, the scientific body that advises the world on climate change, has just released this report with this stark change between 1.5 and 2 degrees. That's a difference between complete disappearance of the coral reefs and a chance of maybe saving 30% of those coral reef ecosystems, and on and on. It's stark. I mean, everything that we care about is at stake here, and, and we have to do more. Severin Borenstein. Well, I, I completely agree that everything's at stake and we have to do more. I think we see differently what's actually going to be effective. Um, uh, first of all, the developing world is producing more greenhouse gases than the developed world now. We are by far more responsible for the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But the path is that the developing world is actually growing faster. They have said they need everyone to reduce greenhouse gases. But China and India are still on paths of building more coal-fired power plants. Uh, and they're doing that because they're poor and they want to grow. And China, people live on uh, per capita GP, GDP that's less than 15% of ours, and India's is half of that. I agree with you that we need to take less fossil fuels out of the ground. But I think going out to the world outside the Bay Area and saying we need to immediately stop producing fossil fuels just will get us nowhere. I think everybody will simply ignore us. And I think the way that we actually will get somewhere and the way that we have gotten somewhere so far to the extent we've made any progress is by, uh, is by innovating. Climate change is a major threat, but it is not the only major threat. And I think the poor countries in the world and the countries that really have shaky democracies are not, would not appreciate strengthening Saudi Arabia, which we now, you, if you've been following, you've known for a long time, is not a uh, real civil uh, 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 advanced country. And Russia, which is now run by an autocrat who is trying to basically expand power. I think that matters too. Bethany McLean, let's get you in here. I mean, you covered you financially cover the markets. It's price is king, right? I mean, that's what really matters. Let's get you on this on whether people will do things for any motivation other than dollars. 
I think at the end of the day, it's dollars that will that will decide this. And maybe I'm a little too cynical from decades of covering the markets, but that is part of the reason that I focused on the financial underpinning of this because I thought if the capital starts stops going into this industry, that's what's going to change things. If investors are unwilling to put money into it anymore, that's where that's where change is for sure going to come about. Not um, not not in any not in any other way because people suddenly decide they're going to they're going to do the right the right thing. Um, and I thought your point about the dollars going to Saudi Arabia um, when we cut production here is is really interesting because we're now seeing it play out in real time how reluctant countries around the world are to disentangle themselves from Saudi Arabia because of the huge pot of money the country has to invest. And when you think about the dollars, the Saudi Arabian dollars that are very active in supporting Silicon Valley right now, there are a couple. There are there's more than one way in which problematic things happen in the world. So you're talking about the Khashoggi, you know, killing, uh, parent killing uh, in, in Turkey, and that's how, how that's brought the geopolitics of Saudi Arabia to the fore. Yes. This idea of uh, American independence or American dominance, you're saying that this shows it's not there yet because of the way people are tipped still showing deference to Saudi Arabia. So when I started the book, I thought it was this interesting conundrum between this idea of American energy independence, which fracking was helping us achieve, and the financial instability of, of the industry. And when things don't add up, I'm always, I'm always interested. But I came to believe over the course of working on the book that this whole idea of American energy independence was itself something of a fraud. And it's something every president going back to the 1970s has been talking about, American energy independence. But you stop to think about what it actually means in today's world, and it turns out those words don't actually mean anything, because the price of a barrel of oil is set by global markets, so it's set by events around the world, no matter how much oil we're producing here. And because business in America depends on imports from other countries who themselves are reliant on Middle Eastern oil, um, it's not as if we can look at Saudi Arabia and the Middle East and say, oh, we're producing all our own oil. We don't need you guys anymore. And you can see that with the current headlines about the horrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi, that nobody is saying, oh, American energy independence, we don't have to care about the Middle East. Quite the contrary. It's really highlighted all the, all the ties that exist between America and, and, and the Middle East. So when people talk about drilling because it's going to grant us this mythical notion of American energy independence, it's, 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 it's kind of a fraud. Mm -hmm.